A small boy was asked to write an essay about anatomy, and this is what he wrote. Your head is kind of round and hard, and your brains are in it, and your hair is on it, and your face is in front of your head where you eat. Your neck is what keeps your head off your shoulders, which are sort of shelves where you hook your overall suspenders. Your arms you've got to have to pitch with, and so you can reach for the biscuits. Your fingers stick out of your hands so you can scratch, throw a curve and add arithmetic. Your legs is what you got to have to get to first base. Your feet is what you run on and your toes are what get stubbed. And that is all there is of you except what's inside, and I ain't seen that. Well, there's been some disagreement about what's inside. Stay tuned. It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written presents The Angel in the Slot Machine. Well, persistent headaches are no joke. And if you've been troubled with them for years and no one has been able to help you, you may be ready to try most anything. Dorothy Cheever, we'll call her that, was in just such a mood when she read in The Tattler one day about a healer who claimed to have phenomenal powers. She cashed a thousand dollar bond, all she'd ever been able to save and bought a plane ticket. When she arrived at the healer's home, no one talked to her. She was put in a room at three in the afternoon and no one said a word to her until 10 the next morning. Then she was taken into the healing room, dimly lit with candles. Smell of incense was oppressive. The walls were hung with dark red tapestries. And in one corner was a small altar and on it a skull cap and a small statue of Buddha. In the center of the room was a table. She was placed on the table. Then the healer came in wearing a brown robe with a pendant on a chain around his neck. She started to tell him about her headaches, but he wouldn't listen. He only said, no need to tell, I know. The healer then turned to the altar with his back toward her. He waved his arm several times and started howling like a wolf. After he'd howled for about a minute, he picked up two small bells and clanged them together over his head. Then he howled some more. After about five minutes of this, he came over to his patient, pointed his finger at her, blew on her head, and left the room. An assistant escorted her immediately to the front hallway and took her check for $500. Well, she insisted on talking to the healer, and he came back for about 10 seconds. All he said was, you'll be all better in three weeks. And his assistant said, your taxi is waiting, and rushed her out the door. Well, Mrs. Cheever was out $500 plus transportation and still had her headaches. Others had similar experiences. In fact, one man died five days after being treated by the same healer. This strange man claims to cure by the means of a Tibetan power that he calls the Way. He also claims to be able to bring to life a corpse long enough to dance with it. It isn't clear what that's supposed to accomplish. A qualified investigator found no evidence whatsoever that he possessed any unusual power, except an uncanny ability to make money. Tell me, friend. Why are healers so popular today? Is it just because so many people are sick? Why are so many people waiting and wanting to do the healing themselves? And how did healing come to be associated with religion? What is the connection? Before answering these questions, let me ask you another. Why did Jesus spend so much time healing? Did you know that he spent more time in healing than in teaching? 
Why was he so interested in the physical health of those that he came to save? That brings us back to the little boy's essay about anatomy. Are we just living machines that can pitch balls and reach for biscuits? Tell me, friend, what's inside? The Greek philosophers had it all figured out, you know. They said that a man consisted of two parts, a body and a soul, each separate from the other, and each very different from the other. They said the soul was eternal, immortal. It couldn't possibly die. But the body was temporary and, of course, could die. They said the soul was spiritual, but that the body was material. The soul was good and the body was evil, so they said. In other words, the soul was as good and as holy as an angel, but trapped in a body as material and as unholy as a slot machine. Now, of course, if the body was evil and only temporary, soon to be thrown away, it made no difference how you treated it. Only the soul was worth taking care of. You see the reasoning? If the body was soon to be cast off, then why not eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die? If the body was only temporary, then why not give it, to the, give, uh, give it the ultimate in thrills and satisfactions? You see, an angel trapped in a slot machine. That's why we've called this our program today. That's our title. Actually, friend, this philosophy, with a little modification here and there, has come right down to our time. There are probably millions who still believe today that a man consists of a good soul in a bad body. They both are completely separate. And that it doesn't make any difference how you treat your body because it's a disposable item anyway. We're eternal souls residing temporarily in disposable bodies. That's the belief. That's the belief of many. Millions today have the idea that if your body is sick, you should visit a physician. But if your soul is sick, you should visit a clergyman. And of course, in this century, a third distinction has been made. If your mind is sick, you should visit a psychiatrist. See, body, mind, and soul, each with their own problems and each with their own therapists. But in the last few decades, physicians have come to realize that you can't treat body and mind and soul separately. The illness of the body affects the health of the mind. Can I say that again? The illness of the body affects the health of the mind, and the illness of the mind affects the health of the body. And a spiritual problem such as guilt affects both mind and body. It does no lasting good to treat one without the other. The whole man must be treated. The whole man must be healed, not just a segment of him, not just a part of him. And so now we're ready, we're really ready now, to answer one of our questions posed a few moments ago. Why did Jesus spend so much of his time healing? Follow me closely. He spent so much of time in healing because he knew how man was made. And he knew how man was made because it was he, Jesus Christ, your Lord and mine, who made him. He knew that man was not made the way it was generally believed. Someone is saying, Pastor Vandeman, wait a minute. Was it Jesus who created man? I didn't know that. Yes, friend, the New Testament writers are very, very clear on that. The Apostle John, for instance, right over here in the beginning of the New Testament, or near the beginning, John 1, very first, very first chapter. John 1, verse 10. Listen, he, Christ, was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Did you remember reading that here? Listen, early in this same chapter, John says of Jesus, whom he calls the Word, verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. 
Jesus, the creator of man. Look, over here, the apostle Paul tells us the same things. Over here in Ephesians, the third chapter and the ninth verse. Listen, God who created all things by whom? By Jesus Christ. See, God created all things by Jesus Christ. And he also says in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, God hath in these last, God has spoken to us in his Son, through whom also he made the world. See, all through the New Testament agrees. And Jesus once said to his critics, John 8, 58 tells us, Before Abraham was, I am. Again and again, Jesus claimed that he and the uh, he and was one with the Father. He claimed to have pre-existed with his Father before he was born in Bethlehem, and this is only reasonable. God gave his Son. There had to be a Son to give, you see. He claimed the power to forgive sins. He claimed to be divine. He claimed to be God. So, when we read in the very first verse of our Bibles, Genesis 1, Genesis, the very first page of the book of beginnings, when we read here, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, we're really reading of the Creator's work, the creative work of Christ, as he pre-existed with his Father. Did you know that? And if it was Christ who created the world, then of course it was Christ who created man, right? Now, wouldn't it be interesting to see how he made man? It may clear up a lot of things for us, especially in this subject we're talking about today, the angel in the slot machine. So let me just turn over a page here and read the second chapter, verse 7, right here in the book of beginnings. Look, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, and man became a living soul. Now notice, it doesn't say God gave man a soul. It says that man became a soul. In other words, man does not have a soul. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. He is a soul. God did not take a body and put a soul into it. All he added to the body that he'd formed was the breath of life the spark of life, the power of life, the body activated. You see, the breath activated the body, made it live. Then man became a living, loving, acting person, a living, loving, acting soul. In fact, the Taylor paraphrase that so many people like for its modern everyday usage, in this instance does no violence at all to the original when it translates this very word that I have just read. It says, and man became a living person. No, friend, the soul is not some mysterious, elusive, separate entity that God put into us. The soul is the whole man. It's the total personality. The soul is you. You were made in one piece, not two pieces or three. Jesus knew that. He knew how man was made because he made him. So that's why Jesus spent so much time healing. He understood man's true nature. He knew that it is difficult for a man to worship in a, with a dull mind or a sick body. He knew that if those he taught were to understand his message, they needed clear minds and strong bodies. And to have clear minds, they must first have healthy bodies. Medical science is now converging on this concept of the whole man that Jesus understood so well. Physicians are now realizing that they must treat the whole man, not just a part of him. They see now that body and mind and conscience are all interrelated and couldn't possibly be separated. But now, let's look at another side of this healing question. If you're a regular viewer of this telecast, you know that there's a war on, a controversy, a conflict between Christ and the enemy of Christ. It's a conflict that is even now reaching the crisis stage. It's about to wind up. Now, if Christ wants us to have healthy bodies so that we can have clear minds, so that we can appreciate his message in this critical 
last time of world history and make right moral decisions, then how about his enemy? Wouldn't the enemy want to, us to make wrong decisions? You see, Satan is not stupid. Satan is a fallen angel. He was once the highest of angels, and he still has his brilliant intellect. He understands oh so well the relationship between body and mind. So wouldn't you expect him to try to dull the minds of men? Not clear them, but dull them. And wouldn't you expect him to work through the body to reach the mind? Of course. You don't need to be told that that's exactly what he's doing on a large scale and with horrible success. Leading men and women and youth to put into their bodies every conceivable thing that will dull the mind and make it incapable of right moral decisions. He's using hard drugs and soft drugs and medicine chest drugs and little pills that keep you awake and little pills that put you to sleep. He's doing it with tobacco and with alcohol and he's doing it even with food. Wrong combinations and too much food. Most of us eat too much these days. I don't need to tell you that you, your mind isn't clear when you've eaten too much. And wouldn't you expect Satan to get into the healing game? Wouldn't he want to try that too? Oh, but you say, surely Satan can't heal, can he? I, I wouldn't think that Satan could work a miracle, we say. Listen, that's exactly why the enemy wants to heal people, because he thinks, because they think he can't. It's exactly why he wants to work miracles, because people think he can't. Do you see what happens? Do you see what happens if Satan heals people? If Satan, work, Satan works miracles and you think he can't, then you will think God is doing the working of the miracles, won't you? And presto, Satan has a following, a following that he can manipulate as he chooses. Well, Satan can work miracles. Satan can heal. You remember the experience of the ancient Job, don't you? Job and his boils. Do you know that do you know who it was that gave him those boils? Did you think it was God? Listen, friend. Job, right over here, about the middle of the Bible. Job, the second chapter in the seventh verse says, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils, from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Who gave Job his boils? Satan. And don't you suppose if he gave Job the boils, he could also take away those boils when he got ready? Let's make it very practical. If Satan could give Job boils, don't you suppose he could give you headaches or arthritis? And now follow it through a little more. If you went to a healer <clears throat> and your headaches and your arthritis disappeared, and you didn't know that Satan could work miracles, you didn't know Satan could heal, then you'd think God did it. Wouldn't you? But could it be, could you be sure who did it? If Satan can heal, how could you know for sure who healed you, God or Satan? There's divine healing. Absolutely there is. Jesus said of his followers over here in the New Testament, Mark 16, verse 18. Mark 16, verse 18. Jesus said of his followers, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. But Jesus also said, over here in Matthew 24, 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect great signs and wonders, and so convincing they will almost deceive God's people. Don't you think some of these great signs and wonders might be the miracle of healing? Christ healed, didn't he? And 
Satan counterfeits every genuine gift, you see. Then wouldn't a false Christ want to heal too? And he'll appear to be Christ, and he'll appear to heal, and he'll appear as though he's giving Christ's message. Wouldn't that be the way to fool people? See, the prophets healed, didn't they? They wouldn't. They, they, then wouldn't you think that a false prophet would want to heal too? Or appear to at least? Do you see the dilemma? How can we possibly tell whether a miracle of healing or any other miracle is from God or from Satan? How can we know the source of the miracle? Certainly not by evaluating the miracle. Certainly not by how spectacular the miracle is. No. If we try to settle it by evaluating the miracle, you'll get mixed up every time. Don't look at the miracle. Look at the message. Evaluate the message. The teachings of those who work the miracles, that's the only way to tell, friend. That's the only way to tell. God doesn't leave us in the dark. We don't have to be deceived. Or even in the slightest doubt, God gave us through the prophet Isaiah a perfect test to apply an unfailing way to identify the source of a miracle or of a teaching. I've quoted it on this program before, and I'll be quoting it again, I'm sure. This is what it says, Isaiah 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There it is. Test them by this book. If they don't measure up, if they don't, if they contradict what this book says in any way, they can only be a counterfeit. This book is the only safe guide. Wouldn't, without it, we would be blown by every wind that comes along. There are miracles everywhere. Miracles in voodoo. Miracles in Eastern religions. Miracles everywhere, in the church and out of the church. Friend, Stay close to this book, and you'll be safe. Well, to sum up, Jesus knew how man was made. He knew that man was made in one piece. He knew the close relationship of body and mind. So he healed the bodies of men and women so that they would have clear minds to accept him and to have the joy of following him intelligently. There's another reason why Jesus spent so much time in healing. It was his incredible passion for men and women. He loved them. He couldn't bear to see them suffer. Sometimes he went through villages and healed all of their sick. He didn't leave one cry of pain in the entire town. His compassion today, friend, is no less than it was then. I know. The Savior is touched by every affliction that comes to us. He's hurt by our hurts. And he longs for the day when sin and suffering will be no more. But there's no compassion in false healing, though there may appear to be. Satan has only one purpose, to deceive and to destroy. He wants to dull the mind so that it cannot appreciate the value of salvation, the salvation that Christ offers. He wants to dim the vision so that we cannot see the Savior's face. Oh, friend, he wants to captivate the ears so that we can't hear the Savior's appeal and have them crowded out. But listen, I've got good news for you. You can choose whose voice you will listen to, whose face will fill your vision, whose word you'll believe, and whose steps you will follow. The choice is yours. And I wonder if you would like to make that choice right now. Make it in favor of the lovely Jesus, the compassionate Savior, the one who proved long ago on a rough and rugged cross just how much he cared. Wouldn't you like to make that choice now in favor of him? as we pray together. Lord Jesus, of course we would. In our saner moments, we know that this is the only way. 
Help us to keep our bodies strong and our minds clear so that we can hear distinctly that life-giving invitation that can make us whole. Give us the healthy, happy, and dedicated lives you want us to have. In your wonderful name, we ask it. Amen.